I invite you to go ahead and take your Bible and find Luke chapter 23. Luke chapter 23, and while you're turning there, let me just tell you that, uh, man, I have, uh, I've needed this week, I needed to uh, have a time where I got away from, uh, from my normal duties a little bit, and I don't mean that in a bad way, but everybody kind of needs a, a little break every once in a while, and, and uh, from, from doing that, not from preaching, just from, from, from ministering sometimes, it just becomes, believe it or not, it becomes a heavy load. Your burdens become our burdens, and and uh, when you multiply that several times over in the, in the congregation, it becomes a whole lot to carry. So I just, I, I thank the Lord for the time that uh, Tracy's allowed me to come and, and be here. I've had a good time with some of the guys and gals. Uh, I don't want you to think bad about this or think that we're wasting time, but uh, just the opportunity to come and, and be in the arena a little bit this week and, 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 and enjoy that, enjoy some some just clearing of the mind and, and, and some roping. It's, it's just been a, it's been a fabulous time. And of course, Tracy and Lois, they are incredible hosts and hostesses. Lois, I know that when I come and stay, uh, she tolerates it. I don't know if you know that uh, Lois may be the cleanest human being on the face of this earth. And then for you to throw another, you know, man into the mix and and he lays things around, leaves things laying around. I, I you know, I, I think that she she deserves a purple heart, some kind of heart uh, for putting up with uh, putting up with uh, me as a guest and but it's just it's just been so good. I enjoy the conversations that we have around the table round cups of coffee, and uh, just being with Tracy. I've learned a lot from Tracy uh, over the years, and uh, his friendship uh, means more than, than any of you would ever be able to really understand and comprehend. Uh, listen, I don't want to go on and on and, and just waste your time with, with soggy stuff, but it's important for a, a pastor to have another pastor in his life uh, that uh, can pour into him and uh, help him through some times, and Tracy's been that for me. You're in Luke chapter 23. I'm going to begin to read verses 32, and I'm going to read all the way to verse 43. Uh, I know sometimes I read a lot of Scripture. Uh, I told you before, I get in trouble more when I'm doing other than <laughs> reading Scripture. When I'm not a, reading the Scripture, I'm apt to get in trouble. But I've never gotten in trouble for reading too much Bible. So I always, uh, I always want to just read the entire context of, of whatever I'm preaching if I can. And when you get there in Luke chapter 23 and you're looking at verses 32 through verse 43, you're going to recognize the passage of Scripture. And uh, I'm going to take just a little bit of a different approach uh, to this thief that gave his heart to the Lord uh, on the cross. But I just really want to draw some truths that are just true about salvation. So that's kind of my direction that I'm going. If you want to kind of just stay hooked up with me, we'll talk about the guy. But what I'm gleaning the most from this passage of Scripture is some, some just bedrock truths about what it is and what it takes and what it looks like and what it is to become a child of God. So, so let me read this passage of Scripture that you've heard many sermons preached from uh, here in Luke chapter 23. Listen to this. It says, And there were also two other uh, malefactors, which, by the way, your translation may actually use the word thief, but I'm just going to stop and I'm going to say something about the word malefactor. If you get in your mind that this guy is some sort of just a petty you know, bubblegum thief, you're really misunderstanding and you're missing the incredible statement about salvation that's being made in this passage of Scripture. This malefactor, when you look the word malefactor up in the original language, it means that he was the worst kind of criminal. He wasn't just a thief. Man, he was a gangster. He was the worst 
kind of criminal uh, in their day. There would be no way of numbering uh, the offenses that he has made towards the human race in his life. This was, if I can say it this way, this was a bad cat. This was a bad, bad dude. Now, let me, let me read. Led with him to be put to death. And when they were come to the place which is called Calvary, there they crucified him and the malefactors, one on the right hand and one on the left. Then said Jesus, or then said Jesus, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. And they parted his raiment and cast lots, verse 35. And when the people stood beholding, and the rulers also with them, deriding him, saying, He saved others, let him save himself, if he be Christ, the chosen of God. And the soldiers also mocked him, coming to him and offering him vinegar, and saying, If you be the king of the Jews, save yourself. Verse 38. And the superscription or the subscription also was written over him in letters of Greek and in Latin and in Hebrew. This is the king of the Jews. Now, verse 39 is kind of where our story actually really begins. And one of the malefactors, which were hanged, railed on him, saying, If thou be Christ, save thyself and us. But the other answered, rebuking him, saying, Dost not thou fear God, seeing that thou art of the same condemnation? And we indeed justly, for we receive the due rewards of our deeds, but this man has done nothing amiss. And he said unto Jesus, Lord, remember me when thou comes into your kingdom. Verse 43. And Jesus said unto him, Verily I say unto thee, Today shalt thou be with me in paradise. Heavenly Father, bless your word, bless the reading of your word. Father, we believe that this word that we read is the very breath, God, of yourself. And Father, I just pray once again that you would uh, grant me a special anointing from the Holy Spirit of God. And Father, I bind any kind of spirit that would be in this room that is not the Holy Spirit. I pray the Holy Spirit would have such a preeminence and a freedom to be able to do what only the Holy Spirit can do. So, Holy Spirit, we welcome you in this place. And in the name of Jesus, we bind any other spirit that could be in this room. Now, Lord, I pray that you would accomplish, you would accomplish your will tonight. And, Father, I pray that I would be a vessel that is fitting for what you have called me to do, this task that you've called me to do in preaching. And Father, I do pray once again that uh, if I plan to say anything that is nonsense or it's not truth, Father, strike those things from my heart and mind. And then, Father, I do pray that I would always have the courage to be led of the Spirit, to say things that I never even planned to say, Holy Spirit, please be my teacher tonight. And it's in Jesus Christ's name I do pray. Amen. When you look at this passage of Scripture, I just want you to see first off who salvation is offered to. Now, I'm going to make a big statement, and I don't want to get in any kind of fight with you, and I don't want anybody to get in, you know, to sit there and start having theological arguments with me. And I sure don't want to meet you out in the foyer and let's see if what I'm about to say is true. But I'm going to make a really big statement. The first thing that I glean from this passage of Scripture is that our Lord Jesus Christ is willing and can save. Now, here it is. Anybody, anytime, anywhere. And you say, is that a big statement? Say, Listen, some folks don't believe that. But I'm telling you right now, our Lord Jesus is willing and does, on a daily basis, save people anywhere, anytime, anybody. I like what Adrian Rogers said one time when he said, you show me one person 
who was sincere in their approach to God and God rejected them, he said, I would not serve that God. He said, if God ever rejected anybody that was sincerely seeking him out, he said, I would close my Bible. It's a pretty big statement. And Adrian Rogers said, I would never preach again. He believed what I believe, that there isn't anybody who has ever been sincere in their approach to the Lord, a sincere seeker, we call it, that has ever sincerely seeked out, sought out salvation that was ever, ever rejected. You know, when you read a passage of Scripture like this, uh, obviously, the question comes, is deathbed experiences something that you and I can look at and say, I can see God doing that. I can see that God would allow and be merciful at someone in their very last moments, in their very last uh, minutes on this earth, that he would grant them an opportunity to get saved even on their deathbed. And I want to tell you, I absolutely believe that many people have been saved literally with their last breaths. I can tell you that I personally have witnessed people who have gotten saved on their deathbed. Now, before I go any further, let me just say this to you. There, there is nothing in Scripture that says that you ought to assume that you're going to have an opportunity to have a deathbed experience. Now, listen to my words because I'm really trying to say some things very carefully. And I don't want you to hear sermons that I'm not preaching, so I'm choosing my words carefully. Don't assume that you could have a deathbed experience, but do deathbed experiences take place? And the reason I tell you don't assume that a deathbed experience could happen for you is because you can't get saved unless the Holy Spirit of God draws you. The Holy Spirit of God has to be present, and he can be present in a hospital room. He can be present while the hospice people are around in your living room. He can be present. Listen, this may shock you. You can still get saved in church. There are still churches that you can get saved in. And you would think that that's a pretty uh, 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 a waste of time statement. But in a lot of churches, we make it so hard to come to Jesus. We put up so many barriers, uh, barriers and so many hurdles that people have to jump over and, and curtains to run through and obstacles to run through to come to Jesus. I remember one time I was preaching revival in Oklahoma. The town wouldn't matter to you. But I was preaching revival in Oklahoma. And that night... For some reason, God fell on that service in a special way. And we saw many, many, many people that night give their heart to the Lord. And I remember that after the service, the pastor said to everyone who got saved, I need to meet with you. Please don't leave. I need to meet with you in the fellowship hall tonight if you gave your heart to Jesus. And he wanted me to come and be a part of that meeting with the new converts that night. And I thought, well, that's... that's that's not out of this world. I'm not blown up by that. If we're going to go and encourage them and visit with them, pray with them, tell them what the next steps might be, help them in being obedient as God is leading them from that moment on, I was all for that. But when we got in that room, he began to ask them all kinds of theological questions. And it was almost like he wanted them to prove to him that they had enough understanding to really understand what they just did. And, and pretty soon, I was, because he went on and on and on and on and on. I know you think I go on and on and on and on. This guy, after church, went on and on and on and on, wanting to make sure that they understood uh, what it was to be saved. And pretty soon, I was looking in the room, and man, those new converts were doing what I was doing. We were counting the tiles in the ceiling, man. We couldn't believe that he was questioning so much about whether or not these people got saved. Please tell me you understand something when you get saved. At salvation, there is nothing to prove. There's nothing to earn. There's a lot to learn. And in time, if God allows you to live, you'll learn it. Listen, discipleship is as much caught as it is taught. You cannot help, you can't help but grow in the Lord 
any more than you can help when you're born as an infant child to grow from being a baby to a toddler to an elementary to a teenager. To Growing is part of the process. And when you're born again, it's a lot like being born physical. The moment you're born again, you are a baby. Amen or not? And you do need to be fed. And there needs to be a certain diet for those that are just born again. And once you stay on that diet for a little while, Paul says, you know, you kind of you leave the milk and you move to the meat. Amen or not? Now listen to me. Some of you, I don't mean this in a bad way, but you've been sucking for a long time. Are y'all all right? Can I just tell you right now that if you want to grow, you can grow. You're in a place that probably spreads the table of discipleship and, and growing and maturing and understanding who you are in Christ. There's probably not a church anywhere, anywhere that does it any better than this church does. And I'm going to tell you as a pastor, I don't mind baby and babies. And I mean that. When you're young in your faith, I don't mind treating you that way. And I don't mind you acting that way. I don't mind treating babies like babies. But after a while, everybody smile at me. How many of y'all know there's something wrong if we got to if, if, if we got to part your whiskers to get the tit in? Y'all all right? Now, I know some of you are having problems with that. But you... Listen, you're not from New York City. You're from Arkansas. Listen, if we have got to part your whiskers to feed you, there's something wrong. You have been babied and being a baby for far too long. Amen or not? But at the moment that somebody gets saved, that's no time to ask them if they know the book of Levitic Le Leviticus. I can't even say it now. And I've been saved for a long time. Friend, listen to me. You can get saved, and you don't have to prove anything at the moment of salvation. There's a lot for you to learn, and you'll learn it. And it comes in time. When I was pastoring in Calvin, Oklahoma, anybody have any idea where Calvin's at? Yeah. Does anybody care? When I was pastoring in Calvin, Oklahoma, a deathbed experience, but it's true, and it just means so much to me that I got to be a part of it. One particular Wednesday night in that little small church, and it was just a little bitty country church, and, you know, we just had a handful of people there for Wednesday night Bible study and, and prayer time. But every Wednesday night, I would end the service pretty predictably the same way every Wednesday night. And at the end of the service, we would take prayer requests, you know how you do, and, and we would ask people, you got anybody you want us to pray for, add to our prayer list? You know, let's talk about those people now. This particular Wednesday night, there was a woman there named Dolores Boone. This is a true story, so there's really got names. Her name was Dolores. She was very faithful to her church. Her husband was named Wes Boone. Her husband didn't go to church. I really didn't know much about Wes at that very moment. But Dolores, every Wednesday night, with tears in her eyes, she would say, Brother Clint, would y'all please pray for my husband, Wes? Normally, I would do what every good pastor does. I'd take my ink pen out, and I'd write Wes Moon down. But as God be my witness this time, when she said with tears, would y'all please pray for my husband, Wes, he needs to be saved. When I started writing Wes Boone down, name down again, this time I, I promise you, I'm not exaggerating. It was as if God took the pen I was writing with and he stuck it right in my heart. And God spoke to my heart and said, this time, don't just write it down. Do something about it. I looked at Dolores Boone that night, and I made a commitment to her in front of that little congregation. I said, Dolores, are y'all going to be home tomorrow? And she looked at me, and she began to brighten up a little bit. And I said, if you don't mind, Dolores, I'd like to come and visit your husband tomorrow. And I'm telling you, she lit up. Her pastor was going to come and visit her husband. 
And I didn't know the history of West Boone that much. He had ran off many a preacher, but I didn't know that. Uh, I later started calling him Cussing West. That'll make sense to you in a little bit. But West was a very crude. To say that he was rough and tough is, a, is an understatement. He was a self-made man, and he was proud of it, and he wanted everybody to know it. And he always made the statement to everybody, I don't need God. I don't need God. Thursday morning, I went about 10 o'clock, and I went out in the country, got in the church's van, and I drove out to West Boone's house. True story. When I pulled up into the yard, he knew who I was. On the side of the van, it said, First Baptist Church Calvin. He knew who I was. He had never met me before. And when I got out of the van, there was Wes. He was stacking wood. It was the fall of the year. He was getting ready for winter. There was a bite in there. He was, he was stacking wood. There was a chain link fence around their, their place. And, and when I pulled up and I got out of the van and I saw Wes there, I looked at him and I said, Wes, I said, uh, I'm the preacher down yonder where your wife goes to church. And as soon as I said that, he went blippity blip blip, blankety blank blank. And I'm telling you, it's been a long time before and since that anybody has ever talked to me that way. I mean, it was filthy, filthy language. I was a young preacher then. I'm 38 now, but I was only like 24. I was only like 24 then. And here I was, you know, at, at, at this church, and I was a very young preacher boy, and I hadn't been cussed out much or ran off much. And when he started cussing, it just shocked me so bad that I just stood there and I looked at him. I was, I was scared to death, but he didn't know that. He confused my not getting in the van and leaving with courage. <laughs> and I just stood there. I was just so blown away that somebody would talk to a preacher that way. And I was just standing there, and finally he just looked at me. He said, well, come on in here then. Come on in. So I walked in there, and I spent about 10 minutes talking to him about how much his wife loved him, how much Jesus loved him. I didn't tell him I loved him. He just cussed me out. But I began to tell him how much he needed the Lord. And here's what he said to me. True story. He said, preacher, you see this house? I said, yes, sir. He said, uh, it's paid for. He was, about, he was then about how old I am now, and you know, 38. <laughs> but he was about my age, and he was so proud of himself. And he said, I don't need the Lord. And he said, preacher, you see these cows out here? He said, everybody that goes to your church that has cows, the bank owns them. He was so proud. He said, bank don't own my cows. He said, I own them. And then he said, you know, I don't mind Dolores going down there to the church. If she needs that, if she needs that crutch, go down to church, I don't keep her from going, but I don't need God. I got in my vehicle after praying with him, and I left. When I got home that night, true story, I got in my little office, and I knelt down, and I was so proud of myself. Little preacher boy, I went and took a cussing in Jesus' name, and I was kind of proud of myself. And I knelt down and I began to pray. And I just, as I was praying, God spoke to my heart. And by the way, every time I say God spoke to my heart, I hope that that's not something that you don't understand. Because listen to me, God speaks to my heart every day. The Bible says my sheep hear my voice and my sheep know my voice. And when I tell you that God spoke to my heart and you think I'm exaggerating, you're scaring me if God don't talk to you. That night, God spoke to my heart just as clear as I'm talking to you right now and said to me, go back tomorrow. I argued with God just a little bit. The next morning, about 10 o'clock, that'd be Friday, I got in the church van I made my way out to West Boone's house. This time he wasn't stacking wood. He was in the barn. I went out to the barn, and I told him who I was again and reintroduced myself. He went blippity, blip, blip, blank, blank, blank. Are you back? And I said, 
Wes, listen to me. God told me to come and see you today. This is really important. This isn't necessarily something I want to do. But God told me to come and talk to you. And I shared once again how much needed Jesus. He kept telling me, I don't need Jesus. I don't need Jesus. I won't never need Jesus. And then he started spouting off all of his possessions again. He says, preacher, you see this barn? I said, yes, sir, it's a nice barn. He said, I built it. I built all of this. I don't need God. I prayed with him. I left. I honestly thought that was it. I got in my office that, that Friday night. I began to pray, and God said, and you're going back tomorrow. So Saturday, I, this time I went at noon because I knew Dolores could cook. Can I just say that to you on Saturday? If you make vi visits and you're going to go see older people, go at noon. They still eat at noon. Are you guys mad? What is wrong with you? I showed up at the, and I knocked on the door. The big door was open. The screen door was there. I knocked on the door. Dolores came and she saw her little pastor and she lit up and I could hear him at the dinner table. He said, blankety blank blank, is he back? And Dolores said, have you ate yet? And I said, no, ma'am. I have not ate yet. And she said, come in here and eat lunch with us. And I went and sat at Cousin Wes's table with him. And believe it or not, me and God was wearing him down. He actually said to me, he said, preacher, I don't mind you coming over here. But he said, I'm never going to go to church. And I'm, I, don't, I don't need God. We ate. And I want you to listen, because I am not embellishing this part. Part of that's embellished, but this part ain't. When we got in the living room, I was so broken after three days of visiting this guy and praying and asking God to lead me and help me. I was so broken for this guy. I was sitting kind of on a love seat. He was sitting in his chair, the, the master's chair, and, and she was sitting right over there kind of on a couch. And I can remember today as if it was yesterday, I can remember seeing my tears hitting the floor where I was sitting. And I was telling him how much Jesus loved him and how much he needed Jesus. And he kept telling me, I'll never go and I don't need Jesus. When I got through visiting with him, I said, can we pray before I go home? And he said, I don't mind your praying. So we stood up and we made a little circle of prayer there in the living room. I held his hand. He held his wife's hand. His wife held my hand. And I began to pray. And I don't know why I prayed like this. I probably wouldn't do it today. But I sure did it then. And I just began to pray what was on my heart. And I said, Lord, Wes is the hardest hearted man I have ever met. And I said, Lord, he's the most prideful man that I ever met. I'm holding his hand. And I said, and Lord, he has so much. And because of what he has, he don't think that he needs you. And then I begin to pray this. I said, Lord, that barn that he's so proud of, I said, Lord, would you knock it down? If that's what it takes for him to come to you. He started to grip my hand. And I said, Lord, those cows in this house that he tells me is paid for, is his. I said, Lord, would you send one of them storms that you sent in Oklahoma? And would you blow it all down if that would bring him to you? And then I ended the prayer this way. I said, Lord, he is so proud about how healthy and strong and what a hard worker he is. And I said, Lord, if it would make him understand how much he needs you, Lord, would you knock him to his knees? And when I said that, he grabbed my hand and he held my hand up and he held Dolores' hand up and he shouted as loud as he could shout and he threw our hands down and he said, preacher, and then he grabbed his wife, 
We're in the living room. He grabbed his wife, went out and got in the pickup, and left. Left me in the house. True story. I didn't know what to do. So I went and ate some more lunch. <laughs> no, I didn't. That part's kind of made up. But let me tell you what I did do. I was scared to death. Lord, did I, did I just shut every door? Did I blow it all? And I just began to look at the walls, and I saw him when he was in his Navy uniform, and I saw him there with his kids, and I saw him there when he was younger and getting a little older. And when I was looking at those pictures on the wall, God spoke to my heart and said this. God said, Wes is just a man, and he's about to learn it. And then I left. About six months from that, that day, and I hadn't been back. God didn't tell me to go back anymore. About six months from that, I was in my little church office getting ready for, for Sunday morning. And the phone rang. And when I answered the phone, there was a woman who was beside herself. And I didn't know who it was. And she finally got it out that it was Dolores. And I thought that maybe he had roughed her up. But she said to me, she said, Brother Clint, I'm okay. It's not me. She said, can you come and see us? And I said, where are you? And she said, we're in Muskogee Veterans Hospital. And it's not good. He's dying. And I got in the church van again. And I made my way to Muskogee from Calvin, Oklahoma. And I stopped off and I picked up a pastor friend of mine. And we made our way to Muskogee Veteran Hospital. And the last time I saw Wes Boone, he was so angry at me that he left and he left me standing in his living room. But when I walked into his hospital room, now listen to me, I'm not trying to be sensational. But when I walked into that room, I could tell by looking at him how bad it was. He was jaundiced. I could tell by the little bag on the side of the bed that his kidneys were failing. I could tell that. I could tell by the monitors and what was going on that this was a very, very serious, sick man in that bed. And when I walked into that hospital bed, here's what West Boone did. West Boone held up that arm that had IVs running out of it, and he held up his arms to me, and he said, Preacher, can I still do it? Can I still do it? And I looked at him, and I was being as honest as I could be. I said, if God is leading you, you can. I said, do you feel like God is leading you to give your heart to him tonight? And he said, oh, preacher, oh, preacher, if I can still do it. We made another little circle of prayer. I held Dolores' hand. She held her son's hand, who was in the room. I held West Boone. We prayed the sinner's prayer. He gave his heart to the Lord that night. Now, I want you to listen. By God's grace, West Boone lived about another six months. But I would go see him several times a week in his home. And when he got really sick, you know what happened. When he got really sick in the last days, they moved his bed to the living room where I prayed that prayer, and he left me with such anger. They moved that bed into that living room. And I would go see him several times a week. Now listen to me, every time I'd go see Wes, as soon as I would walk into the house, the first thing he would do, and he has never been to church, I didn't baptize him. None of that kind of stuff. As soon as I would walk into his living room and I'd see him there on his dying bed, he would reach out his hand to me and he'd say, Come here, preacher. Let me pray for you. And Wes Boone would pray for me. And he'd pray for my little kids. All of my kids were little. And he'd pray for all of my little kids and my wife and our church. I'm telling you, God transformed that man that night in the hospital. I'm going to say it to you again. God, this story tells me, and my own personal experience tells me, God is and can and does save anybody 
anywhere, anytime. Hallelujah. And thank God for his grace. But I want you to see something else. Not only is salvation offered to anybody, but when I looked at this passage of Scripture, it becomes clear to me that salvation comes just like you have been told all of your life that it does. By grace alone and faith alone in Christ alone. That's where salvation comes from. Are y'all still glad you came? Let me tell you why I'm telling you I gleaned this from this story. When you read this story, how many of y'all know this story refutes, it's a 50 cent word, it refutes a lot of doctrines that a lot of people believe. It refutes the doctrine of sacramentalism. Do you know what the doctrine of sacramentalism is? I don't know if you know it or not, but your church and my church, we don't have sacraments. There are churches who believe in the doctrine of sacramentalism. We don't believe in that. We don't have sacraments here. We have some traditional ordinances. An ordinance like the Lord's Supper and baptism is not a sacrament for us. Listen to me. This guy, he was not able to take the communion wine and the communion wafer. He did not go through the waters of baptism. He never had been to church. The doctrine of sacramentalism says this. There are denominations that believe that when you take the communion wine and you take the communion wafer, you are doing something that gives you at that moment grace. We don't believe in sacraments. We don't believe that taking the communion wine and the communion wafer gives us grace. Here's what we believe. We do the Lord's Supper because of the grace that has already fully been extended and given and received by us. We don't take the communion wine and the communion wafer with hopes that it's going to please God and appease the wrath of God and therefore save us. The doctrine of sacramentalism is refuted in this passage of Scripture. No sprinkling, no confirmation. It refutes any kind of doctrine called purgatory. Did you know there is a denomination that believes that when you die, you don't go to your chosen eternity, whether it be heaven or hell. They believe that when you die, you go to kind of a holding tank. And they call it purgatory. Now, I want you to listen to me. There is nothing in the Bible, nowhere, that even suggests that anybody has ever went to or exists in sort of a hanging out spot between hell and heaven called purgatory. Do you know what these people who believe in the doctrine of purgatory believe? They believe that when your loved one dies, they're in this little holding tank, but if you who are alive will come to the church and pray and give. Listen to me. The emphasis is on give. They believe that you can give and sacrifice and give enough money to actually purchase that person out of that place called purgatory. I'm telling you, it is robbery, thievery. It is insane. And yet thousands upon millions of people in America, they go and in that emotional state that they're in, they go and they give all kinds of money, hoping that somehow or another, God will take that gift and take that person out of purgatory. How many of y'all know this Bible refutes that? This story refutes that. Jesus told him, this day, this very day, you will be with me in paradise. No holding tank. Three people died that day. One died for sin. 
One died from sin, one died in their sin. But this passage of Scripture tells us about salvation. Salvation is by grace, faith in Christ, and that alone. It's not in any deed that you and I can do. I don't know if you know this or not, but friend, listen to me. You don't go to heaven for being a good old boy. You don't go to heaven for being a Baptist. Amen or not? You don't go to heaven for taking the communion wine and a communion wafer. You don't go to heaven for being baptized. Baptism has never washed not one sin away. You get baptized to identify yourself and to make a public profession of your faith. It is in every truest sense, your profession of your faith. That you died to yourself. As he was buried, you were buried. But as he rose, you arose to newness of life. Amen or not? Let me tell you another thing. This passage of Scripture tells me that salvation, please listen, because we're almost through. Salvation has always been and will always be rejected by many regardless of how much Christ comes to them. Now, I'm going to say that to you again. It's a long point. That's how you know it's original by me. Smart preachers wouldn't do that. Salvation has always been and will always be rejected by people no matter how many times Christ comes and offers salvation to them. That day, at this scene that's in Scripture, there was all kinds of representation of humanity at the cross. If you was to read verse 35, you'd see a crowd that was indifferent. They were gambling. They didn't care that Christ was being crucified. If you read verse 35, you'd see that there was rulers there. The religious crowd was there. If you read verse 34, you'd see the self-centered people were there. You would see also, when you read verse 42, hallelujah, that there were sincere people there. There was a thief that sincerely cried out for salvation and forgiveness from God. You're in Luke chapter 23. Are y'all still glad you came? Flip over in your Bible, and I'm going to show you something in Luke chapter 16. It's just a couple of pages over. Turn left, and let me show you something in Luke chapter 16. I told you, and I've said something about the fact that salvation will be rejected by many people no matter what God does to offer them forgiveness and repentance. When you get to Luke chapter 16 and you get to about verse 28 and you begin to read, to me, this is some of the most sobering scripture in all of God's word. I want you to listen as, as I read it. You know the story. Listen to what it says in verse 28. Talking about the rich man asking of God for an opportunity for his family uh, to be saved and not come to this place of torment that he's in. Listen to this. He says in verse 27, he said, I pray therefore, Father, that you would send him to my father's house. For I have five brothers, that he may testify unto them lest they also come to this place of torment. Now listen to this. Abraham said unto him, They have Moses and the prophets. Let them hear them. And he said, No, Father Abraham, but if one went from the dead, they would repent. He was wanting uh, Lazarus, the poor man, to be sent from the dead to his brother's house because he knew that if someone has came back from the dead, they might respond to the gospel of Christ. Now listen to this. 
And he said in verse 31, and he said unto him, if they hear not Moses, by the way, uh, that's the preachers, and the prophets, that's the word. He said, neither would they be persuaded. Listen to that word persuaded. Though one rose from the dead. That word persuaded is an interesting word. It's used a couple of different times concerning salvation in the New Testament. You remember one time Paul was witnessing to King Agrippa. And after he witnessed to King Agrippa, King Agrippa said this. He said, thou almost persuaded me. You did a good job witnessing to me. You almost convinced me. The scripture says this. Jesus saying uh, to the rich man, he said, your brothers wouldn't come to Christ no matter what I did. If I was to even raise somebody back from the dead that they knew died, and if I was to send that person personally from the dead, now alive, to their home, your brothers still would not be converted. I told you in the last point that many people will reject Christ no matter what opportunities they have. Now, let me just ask you this question. <laughs> what kind of special thing does God have to do for you? Some of you know that you need to be saved. You know it. You know that something's missing. You don't have to listen to another yelling, screaming, spitting, stomping preacher to know it. You already know it. What kind of special thing does God need to do for you? Does God need to send somebody from the dead to witness to you and tell you there really is a place called heaven and there really is a place called hell? That's not just preacher talk. Give your heart to the Lord. I've often wondered what it takes to convince a man or a woman to give their heart to Jesus. I have preached now for 35 years. And I have looked at faces and I have looked in eyes of good people. I mean good people. I mean good people, but they're lost people. And I've often wondered, what are you wanting? What are you wanting Jesus to do for you? You want him to send an angel to tap dance on your rib cage to give you some sort of funny feeling and emotion that this is your moment. What is it that you're waiting for? Are you waiting for the right song? Are you waiting for the right preacher and the right sermon? Are you going to flatter us one day by saying he finally said it all right? The preacher finally rung the bell and I'm going to be a blessing to him and the church and I'm going to give my heart to Jesus. What's it going to take for you? Let me just tell you something. God is not going to do any more for you than what he has already done. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. That if you would believe in him, you would not have to go to hell. And you could go to heaven. God's not going to do something special for you. He's already done it all. Elon Musk. We were going to church the other night, me and my wife. And my wife was on her phone. And she said, let me read you something. I was on my way to church to preach. And she said, let me read you something that Elon Musk just said two weeks ago. And by the way, in case you think I'm making fun of him or mocking him or trying to paint a picture of him that's bad, I, I'm really not. He, he may be a wonderful guy. I know that he's a little bit conservative because the liberals are scared to death of him. Are y'all all right? But she read to me a quote from Elon Musk two weeks ago. By the way, I'm not making it up. You can Google it when you get home and you can find it. You know, he purchased Twitter. Twitter. 
Man, I'm with it. I am with it. A lady tweeted him and witnessed to him. And his response to her was, he wasn't really trying to be mean. He was just saying, this is the way I feel. She witnessed to him, and he responded back, thank you for taking the time to reach out to me. And then he said this, but I have absolutely no problem with going to hell. He said, if I go to hell, I'll be there with most of the people who's ever walked the face of this earth. And he said, as of this moment right now, I have absolutely no trouble in going to hell. How many of y'all know he can get saved anytime, any place, if the Spirit draws him, he can get saved? Now, he's made a very foolish statement that he has no trouble with dying and going to hell. Do you know what? If he dies and goes to hell, listen to me, dear God, listen to me. The Bible says for those who die and go to hell, it is a place where the worm dieth not. The worm of their conscience and their memory will gnaw at them and it will never cease to gnaw at them throughout all eternity. The worm, the Bible says, of their conscience and of their memory and of what they said and of what they experienced and what they rejected, that worm will never ever cease to torment you in hell. And if he dies and goes to hell, I don't want him to. I hope some preacher or you, somebody will continue to reach out to him and tell him no matter who you think you are, you still need Jesus. And you really don't want to go to hell because when you go to hell for the rest of eternity... You will hear over and over and over and over again. I don't mind going to hell. I don't care if I go to hell. And that worm will gnaw at him and eat at him every moment of every day that he spends his eternity in hell. Do you know You feel like right now that you're really doing something because you're enduring another sermon. If you die and go to hell, do you know what people in hell are doing right now? The passage I just read you in Luke chapter 16, nobody's cocky there. Nobody in hell is is wishing they never heard a sermon. Would you please send somebody to my brother's house? Because I have five brothers and they're just like I was. And when they die, unless they change, they're going to be right here with me in hell for all eternity. Do you know what they're saying in hell tonight? Please, dear God, give me another hour-long sermon to set through. Send another, send somebody. Dear God, give me another opportunity. I'll never mock a preacher ever again for the rest of my life. Give me another sermon. Give me another chance. Give me another invitation. No more teasing about Christians. No more mocking about Christians. Dear God, more than anything in this world, Give me another yelling, screaming, spitting, stomping, begging, crying preacher. Give me another chance. But there won't be any more chances. Because there is no place called purgatory. When you die... You'll either instantly go to hell or you will instantly go into the presence of the Lord. Well, hello, everybody. My name is Tracy Wilson. Thank you so much for being with us uh, via Facebook or YouTube or however you're watching us, whether it be a Wednesday night round pen or a Sunday morning uh, service here at the Cowboy Church. 
Just want to say hello and give you a personal invite to come and be with us here at the Cowboy Church. Uh, there's three options for you. Sunday mornings we have a 9 a.m. service, uh, and then a second service at 10.30 a.m. And then on Wednesday nights, uh, we do what we call a round pin Bible study, which is just getting into the heart of God's Word and studying it for all it's worth. We would love to meet with you uh, here in person at the Cowboy Church. We're so thankful for uh, technology. We've gotten uh, comments on our uh, sermons and Bible studies uh, all the way from Africa. And so we're so thankful. But uh, we do want to invite you here with us uh, to be uh, in person, in house at the Cowboy Church. You know, the Bible says this about salvation. The Bible says clearly in Ephesians 2 8 that salvation is by grace through faith not of works, so no man can boast. Our prayer is that through these messages and through these Bible studies, uh, that the Word of God would uh, find its place in your heart. The promise is that God's Word will not return void. So we want to make ourselves available to you uh, for anything that we can do to help you. If you have questions about this Jesus that we preach about, this Jesus that we serve, this Jesus that we know as our Savior and that the Bible declares as the only Savior. He is the way, the truth, and the life. If you would have a question about that, if we could help you with that, or if God deals with your heart through one of our sermons or Bible studies, and you've responded to that, and you've put your hope and trust, and you've committed to follow Jesus Christ, we would love to celebrate with you about that. We'd love to talk with you about that help you in any way that we can. If you're watching, then obviously you have Facebook or uh, the availability of YouTube. Uh, if we can do anything, I would love for you to personally message me on Facebook. And I would love to correspond with you about this. God is able, and He is able to meet all of our needs. He has extended His grace to us uh, through the offer of forgiveness of our sins and eternal life. I hope that you have taken advantage of that. I hope that you belong to Christ. And please take advantage of Three Trees Cowboy Church. Being here in person or just allowing us to message with you and help you in any way we can. Until then, until we see you in person or we see that message, God bless you and thank you for being with us.